Reverend Bishop Thomas, how are you? Thank you, Ron. I'm well. How about yourself? Yeah, good, good. We're Thank the, the Lord. Summer now. Thank the Lord for these summer days, yes. and I yes. hope and pray that all of our viewers and listeners are have, getting some time away for a rest, relaxation, and some vacation. Absolutely. How about your schedule? Thanks. We'll take a quick peek, folks. That, and I'm just delighted. Uh, the weekend of July 23rd, 24th, there will be held our biannual Deacon Convocation. That might actually be biennial, I think, because I think it's every oh. other year, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So uh, that actually I'll celebrate Mass and then visit with our uh, permanent deacons and their wives at St. Michael in Findlay, where Mass will be at 430. And I think afterwards, it, as part of the convocation, to spend have the meal and spend time with them. And then on Sunday, the 25th, I'll have the joy of installing Monsignor Chas Singler as the new pastor of St. Rose in Perrysburg. So while I can't install every new pastor, it's a joy to re install a number of them. And I think I have five that I'm able to install this year, just simply given the, the crushing calendar, to be frank. And then on Wednesday, the 28th, I have a gathering with our seminarians. So usually during their convocation, I gather with them and I spend time, I give a talk, do a Q&A, and I have at least one meal and some time with them. So in this case, I'll give a talk. We'll have lunch together. And then I think we actually together, uh, Father Phil Smith, our vocation director, has planned, I'm going to be going to the Toledo Art Museum with mm -hmm. the seminarians for a, a particular tour. So I look forward to that event as well. Wonderful. All right. Thank well, you. Let's get to a recent gospel from Mark. Uh, Please. Um, from the 16th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The apostles gathered together with Jesus and reported all they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. People were coming and going in great numbers, and they had no opportunity even to eat. So they went off in the boat by themselves to a deserted place. People saw them leaving, and many came to know about it. They hastened there on foot from all the towns and arrived at the place before them. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Bishop, your thoughts? I think the reflection first struck me as this beautiful line of Jesus, come away by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. What a beautiful indication that Jesus is speaking to his own apostles and encouraging them to rest. I guess I should take... <laughs> I, I should take heed of that, Ron. Uh, maybe I should say I should take better heed of that. But I, I, I want to talk simply about taking a retreat today based on this. And obviously, Jesus is inviting them, come away by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. In the end, taking a retreat, and I know so many of our folks simply don't have the occasion or the opportunity to take a longer retreat, but there are wonderful opportunities all throughout our diocese and especially our shrines to take time to be away, even for a day, to be away to a deserted place, because there's not that many people who are there, to be quiet, to pray, and to rest in him. I can share with you folks after COVID, uh, you know, one of the places, as you know, that I try to go is uh, Gethsemane, which is a monastery in uh, Kentucky, where I've gone a number of times. This year, because of their schedule and coming out of COVID, I was only able really to get a possibility of three days there, which won't work. So again, and I have to plan this or it won't happen. I have to plan the time to get away, to go to a deserted place, to rest in him. So my retreat, I'm sure you'll hear later, is coming up in September. I just invite you to take a consideration of that, even if, and I know folks who do this, even if maybe a day like that is just on your back patio and you just say, I'm going to take a quiet day and maybe I'm going to take the quiet morning or just be quiet and rest a while in the Lord so that you are refreshed, not just physically, which is vacation, but spiritually, which really is retreat. And then maybe talk to folks and ask, well, gee, maybe I could read something that would nourish my soul and take that time. If it's a day, if it's a few days, beautiful. If you can get a week, all the better. How wonderful. But to take the time, as Jesus says, come away by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. And nobody implies, come away by yourselves, come with me. So it's not being alone, it's being with Jesus. And then, of course, at the end, when he does see the crowd, though, and he realizes they can't get away, 
he goes right back to work. Which really, in <laughs> in the end, doesn't that show the pastoral heart of Jesus? Exactly. He invites them to come away. He tries to get time for them to rest and to be yeah. quiet. And the people, because of how excited they are to be with Jesus, they crowd around and they follow him. And he has a heart for the people. And therefore, he doesn't send them away yeah. and say, go away, I don't care. Instead, he immediately responds. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Let's get a question in here. Before Please. Before the break, we'll go to Brian and Clyde, dear Bishop Thomas. So what is the history of bishops and the Pope wearing a ring? Would you tell us where your ring came from? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. And I have to tell you that this is a question I've gotten before a number of times. I think we may have answered it at least once on this show in my years here. And you need to know that from early history, the the bishop has been wearing a ring principally as a sign of being wed to the church. So obviously, couples exchange rings today. That's very popular. And it first became a sign of their commitment to one another. So therefore, husband and wife wear, wear a ring. And so the bishop wears a ring. I think it, it's important to say that the ring is part of the regular, if you will, pontificalia or regalia of the bishop. And he also wears a ring which is given to him at his consecration as a bishop. So it's one of the three principal symbols of the office of bishop, the ring, the crozier, and the mitre. They're the three principal symbols. And, you know, in the past, uh, if you go to the Vatican, you can look in the Vatican Museum, you know, cases, these enormous rings with enormous jewels that popes used to wear while riding, and they would go over their gloves. I mean, it's <laughs> really quite something, or something as simple as the ring I'm wearing now, which uh, is simply has uh, Peter and Paul on either side of Jesus, which is a ring, a copy of a ring that uh, Pope Paul VI gave to bishops many, many times. So I think it's just important to say that it's a symbol of being wedded to the diocese. It's ancient in its custom. And uh, I should also add, actually, Brian, that the ring of the fishermen, which would be Peter's ring for centuries, has had particular symbols on it. And of course, you may or may not know, Brian, that at the at the Pope's death, that ring is then smashed, and then a new ring, his new ring, is made from the ring that was smashed, mm. so that there's a continuation of him wearing the same ring, being wedded, obviously, to the church as the successor of Peter. Wonderful. All right. Yeah, hey, I'm going to go ahead and get another one in, Bishop. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Jan and St. Michael Hicksville. Uh, Dear Bishop Thomas, a lot of people would like to receive our Lord at the communion rail. What can we do to get that back in the church? Thanks, Jan. Thank you so much, Jan. So uh, just to note that in the dioceses of the United States, Holy Communion is received standing unless an individual member of the faithful wishes to receive communion while, nearing, while kneeling. When receiving Holy Communion, the communicant makes a bow of body or head before the sacrament as a gesture of reverence. So I can tell you, Jan, I grew up with an altar rail because the altar rail was there and the new liturgy had just come into vogue when I have a memory that is the ordinary form of the Holy Mass, which was the revision of the liturgy after 1963. So the vast majority, and you may or may not know this, Jan, in many, many of our parishes, altar rails were completely removed and simply are not there anymore. And for the purposes of reception, the kneeling it, it really does not take place across an altar rail, but it's with the idea of a communion procession where people come in procession and then, of course, make a reverence before they receive. So that's simply the reality of receiving the Lord. And you may know that in the extraordinary form, People still do receive Holy Communion while kneeling at the altar rail. I have to tell you, because <laughs> we don't have time for uh Oh, folks, get ready. Here About we go. A month ago, I met a wedding in Kentucky. Now, I've said on the show many times, I'm a convert you know, sure. in the late 80s, right? And we're at this wedding, and they get ready for communion, and they're all going to a communion rail. 
And I had to turn to my wife and say, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was easy though. I, I, you was, just followed it, the leader. It was extremely easy, but sure. the initial thought was, oh, I've never done this before. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, uh, the reality is that the vast majority of our parishes simply at this moment do, and at this time yeah. don't have communion yeah. rails. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. why we receive standing. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. All right. We have to take just a quick break, folks. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right Stay with back. us, everyone, please. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we are back here at the Bishop's Corner. So glad you're still with us, everyone. Folks, we are always anxious to get your questions. Uh, there are a couple easy ways to get those. You can go to AnnunciationRadio.com and click on the Bishop's Corner. A little template will pop up. You put your email in there. But you can shoot us a text. Uh, any way you get your question to us is fine. Uh, we would like you to maybe give your first name or your parish or your town you're from, something like that, so the bishop has an idea who he's speaking with. Uh, we do our best to get them in, don't we, Bishop? We don't always make it. But, but we're going to push. We're going to work, and thank we're going to start with Florence at Maumee St. Joe's, uh, who says, thank you for your presence on the Bishop's Corner. Uh, she has two questions. Question one, what is, church's, what is church teaching about what happens when a mother whose body is carrying and nourishing a fetus in pregnancy receives the Holy Communion? You want to do that one first, and then I'll ask you the second. Why not? Why, uh, sure. Why don't we do that? Yeah, go Fine. Ahead. So, Florence, first of all, thank you for, for writing from All Me St. Joe's. And your first question, I must say, I how many questions do I get? What is church teaching on? And then I never know what's going to follow. But you ask a question, and and frankly, Florence, I, I simply don't know that there is church teaching, particularly to your question. So you ask, what happens when a mother whose body is carrying and nourishing a fetus in pregnancy, receive Holy Communion. I can only guess, Florence, because I don't know your mind or why you asked the question. I'm presuming maybe what's behind your question is, are the graces of the Holy Communion for the mother also somehow communicated to the child in her womb? If that is your question, Florence, then I would simply say, when we receive the Holy Eucharist, we take the Lord unto our body, and if a woman is pregnant, the baby is part of her body, right? So I would say, if that's your question, that somehow, obviously, the Lord's grace in Holy Communion is for the recipient. Now, that's not to say, you know, the baby is not receiving communion somehow in the womb. But I would say that if the mother is receiving and there are graces for her, then somehow the graces are extended also to her unborn child in the womb. So I hope that's a helpful answer. I do not know, Florence, of specific church teaching on this particular question. Okay. And her second uh, part question is, what is the church's position on collection and use of umbilical cord stem cells collected at the live birth of an infant? So thanks, Florence. And of course, that's the second question that I always wonder, uh-oh, what's coming after the words, what is the church's position on? So you ask, Florence... The collection and use of umbilical cord stem cells collected at the live birth of an infant. So, Florence, I, I appreciate that your question is so clear because certainly, number one, every viewer and listener knows that there is absolute no possibility of taking stem cells from a fetus or a child still in the womb. That's very, very clear because the use of stem cells that are taken from abortions, abortions are immoral. Therefore, the taking of the stem cells would also somehow be immoral. However, what you say is the use of umbilical cord stem cells collected at the live birth of an infant. So I think your distinction is very helpful to us. If there is some method that collects the umbilical cords after the birth, notice how careful I'm being, after the full birth of the baby from the womb into the world, if there is something where that umbilical cord is then taken with the baby alive and healthy, then there is absolutely no reason why those umbilical cords could not be used to harvest stem cells and to use those stem cells 
either in research or for the care, perhaps, of people who would benefit physically from those stem cells. So be careful of the distinction, but I think you make the distinction even in your question. So thank you, Florence. Okay, great. Uh, let's go to uh, Alice in Sylvania, dear Bishop Thomas. Thank you, Alice. I would like to know, what are some other grave sins except for thou shalt not kill? Uh, being an adult, and my mind is always running as a sinner, I've been questioning all of my sins as grave. I know the three conditions to make it grave, but what are some of the sins that I should look for in everyday life that would put me in mortal sin? Thank you so much, Bishop Thomas. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, Alice. So I can tell you this is a sensitive question, Alice. Yeah. I appreciate your writing from Sylvania. And I think it's a question that a lot of people have. How do I determine whether my, my actions, my sins, or even you know sins of omission or commission, how do I determine that they are grave? Or mortal. So, Alice, not to be trite, but here it is on the mug, you know, Alice, go to the sources. Now, you indicate, I think, you may have already gone a little bit to the sources because you mentioned there are three conditions to make it grave, and that's very, very helpful. So, I would suggest that you go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's under the different kinds of sins, beginning with paragraphs 1852, 1853. Then, the gravity of sin, moral, and venial, 1854, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, and then 61, 62, 63, and 64. So I would direct you directly to the catechism for a fulsome answer of your question. But when you ask, you know, for a sin to be mortal, here are the three conditions, because you say there are three, good for you. Our listeners and viewers should hear them. For a sin to be mortal, three conditions together must be met right from the Catechism, 1857. Mortal sin is sin whose object is grave matter and which is also committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. It's very, very clear. Those are the three conditions. And we talk, then they talk about full ma grave matter. They talk about full knowledge. And then they talk about unintentional ignorance. So if someone does something grave, I mean, I can't imagine someone murdering someone and then saying they didn't know murder was wrong and it was forbidden by the Fifth Commandment, but in unintentional ignorance can qualify the sin. So I think all of those points would be helpful for you. I think it wouldn't be appropriate to, quote, name certain sins as being grave. Why do I say that? Because, Alice, you see that three things are conditions to make it grave the conditions may not be the same for each person. So I think it's helpful and careful that we know what they are and then make an examine of conscience of whether that I am in any grave sin. And I would just caution, you say, I, I've been questioning all my sins as grave. I think I would suggest, Alice, discuss that with a priest or your confessor, because every sin that any of us has, every sin likely, very possibly, is not in fact grave in nature. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so Thanks much, Alice. Question. Uh, we're going to go to Bradley. Do we have time for that? Lexington. Yes, You're we amazing, do. Ron. Resurrection Parish. I'm, boy, Bradley's uh, happy about that. Dear Bishop Thomas, uh, he says, I'm a volunteer for the parish library here in Lexington. Uh, he says, you've met in person twice. There you go. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, he's got three questions. Three quick questions, he One, says. One, <laughs> how do popes choose their names, and what is the origin of popes having religious names? Go with that one. So, number one, how do popes choose their names? It's obviously, Bradley, up to them. You may or may not know the story, now very public. Of Pope Francis, someone said when he went into the conclave, someone whispered to him, one of the other cardinals, apparently, don't forget the poor. And when it was clear that as Jorge Bergoglio, it was clear that his brother cardinals were likely going to elect him as pope, apparently he prayed in that moment and thought of taking the name of Francis. And so when they ask, and they, they come right over, they tell, they tell the man who's been elected, you have been elected, do you accept? And then what is your name? Of course, all that is done in Latin, Ron. If I did in Latin, you would have been able to translate it for us. All. So, no. Bradley, that's the first question. And obviously, in the Pope's case, he recalled that person. He's told the story of it. And he thought, I should take Francis. So each Pope, you know, Benedict took Benedict because he of his knowledge and understanding of the previous Popes who were named Benedict. 
John Paul II took that because his immediate processor took John Paul a double name. And he was carrying on, if you will, the legacy of someone who died in 33 days. So that just gives you a, an idea. Okay. Yeah. Second question. What level of obedience and theological assent must we give in cyclicals and apostolic exhortations? So I think it, the, obviously we are asked to give theological assent to anything that is ordinary magisterium. And ordinary magisterium includes encyclicals and apostolic exhortations, and we're asked, and I appreciate your your careful language, assent, because so often we hear Bradley of, well, you know, I I probably I dis I dissent from this teaching. I think the bottom line is we have to look at the teaching, and I think this is a beautiful way to do it. If I cannot give immediate assent, I have to withhold my dissent until I study, understand more deeply, and recognize that I'm now able to make assent to this teaching. Okay. Thank good. you. Uh, the third thing, and I'm, I want to hear this. <laughs> Did you ever write anything? An Episcopal letter? <laughs> a dissertation? He writes mean notes to me all the time, Bradley, so just so everybody knows. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you? I didn't know you and Bradley were... <laughs> We're pen pals. That's really impressive. Did you ever write anything, an Episcopal letter, a dissertation, et cetera? And if so, how can I get a hold of it to read it? My goodness. Well, Bradley, I can tell you, you can get hold of things I write all the time. So did I ever write anything? I've written things since I was <laughs> able to write. So that's that answer. But I think the biggest thing, Bradley, that I try to do for our people is my leading the flock column. And that's one of the ways that I try to make an effort to exercise my teaching office. I've also, for example, written articles that appeared in various newspapers, etc. So I think it's important for you to know that I often write, and very often you can find that on our diocesan website because it's it's put out in our social media. Okay. Thank hey, you. We've got a couple minutes. Um, just kind of end of the, not end of the summer, but we're... Ron, don't say end of summer yet. Maybe for some people, the school is beginning soon, but yeah, my but, summer doesn't end until yeah, September is okay, already here. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But we're, you know, we're moving along here. Uh, and people realize we taped this ahead a little bit, so we don't sure. know for sure. But is your sense, uh, coming off the pandemic now, people are returning uh, to mass? Are, mm -hmm. are you sensing that? Are, are you hearing that from your priest? Sure. Well, I think two things I, I could share on that sure. regard. And, uh, many of our pastors have, in fact, told me that they are just ecstatic and delighted that many of the flock have returned to the pews. And that's a great, great gift. So thank you. And I would encourage you, if you know anybody who hasn't returned yet, who had gone to mass, encourage them. Some of our pastors say maybe they're not up to the numbers they were pre-COVID, but again, pre-COVID was a year and a half ago. Oh, absolutely. But a number of them also say, pardon me, they're now seeing people who they've not seen before, and that's a great gift too. Yeah. You know, I heard that from somebody recently mm -hmm. that told me that, that there, some people, the pandemic seemed to have like stimulated them. Had an impact in that way. Somehow, yeah, had some kind of impact. And Ron, it is related because, you know, Catholics are givers and that's a great gift to the church because they are so generous. So I can also tell you that the vast majority of our parishes have seen tremendous generosity from our faithful, especially during COVID time. And you should know our annual Catholic appeal is over 95% of goal and it's only July. Yeah. So the hope would be that we would go well over goal in order to support our diocesan ministries. And I can tell you there are, my gosh, there's at least 20 parishes over goal. Some parish, one parish is over 250% of goal. So that's pretty extraordinary. Mm. But I think that's a sign. The generosity is also a sign of people coming back and engaging the church. And I pray God that that will continue and invite folks who are not to make their way back if they are not compromised physically, obviously, and invite others to consider returning, and perhaps those who are not Catholic, to invite examining the faith, as I just had a letter from a young man who told me that I, I spoke to him in a, in a, a talk, and he is de desirous now of thinking about becoming Catholic, and he asked if he could come and discuss that with me. Wonderful. So I, I said, I'm delighted to do so. Wonderful. So I think that's happening, and we have to pray that that's the case and also pray for our own increase in appreciation for and devotion to and receiving worthily 
the Holy Eucharist at Sunday Mass. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Could we get a prayer and a bless? Surely. So we'll take the prayer as we did take the gospel from, I believe, Ron, the 16th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let us pray. Show favor, O Lord, to your servants, and mercifully increase the gifts of your grace, that made fervent in hope, faith, and charity, they may be ever watchful in keeping your commands. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. Thanks to you always for hosting no, us. Happy to do it. Thanks to our viewers and listeners for being with us. We're just delighted that you are engaged by watching or listening to the Bishop's Corner. We'll see you again right here, folks, next week. God bless you. Bishop's Corner.